Hey, um, we, are, we are in a series at the moment to start our year called Be Still, a, a really exciting and encouraging series. Um, and if we think back a couple of weeks, Dave Luthy uh, kicked us off with the idea of removing some of the barriers. What are some of the things in our lives that cr- uh, stop us from being able to be still? Things like uh, busyness, things like expectations that we place on ourselves and on um, ex- expectations from others things like our own habits that we get involved in. And so we spoke about removing some of those barriers. And then last week, Graham spoke to us from that famous, or famous, that well-known verse from Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. And he spoke about even through the storm and through the chaos and through the the peaks and the valleys that happen in our lives, uh, God is the one who brings order out of that chaos. And this morning, what we're going to talk about is something that I think is going to be really beneficial to each one of you uh, here and those of you listening and watching online. It's something that we all need. It's something we all really love at times. And the title for our message today is Be Still and Rest. Be Still and Rest. And last weekend, we kind of had a little bit of an opportunity to do a bit of this resting in some sense, because we all found ourselves, at least in Greater Brisbane, in this kind of lockdown, didn't we, due to COVID. From 6pm Friday to 6pm Monday, we were kind of confined or locked down, which I don't like that term, you know, you kind of feel like you're, you're trapped in your own property to some degree. But we all got through that, and thankfully we didn't have any new cases reported, and the restrictions were eased just a little bit. But what I think we saw were images of Brisbane City that were ones that wouldn't normally be typical for a Saturday or for a weekend in Brisbane. It was a bit like a ghost town, a bit sleepy. There weren't a lot of people out and about um, around the suburbs. I don't know if you had the same sort of thing or saw the same sort of thing. I noticed a whole lot less noise from cars on my street and it felt a bit eerie. When I did venture out for my little hour um, exercise, I noticed a whole lot less people out and about. And when I actually reflect back on that weekend that we just had, if I had to use one word to describe it, I mean, I could have used a lot of words, but I reckon one of those words that I would use would be restless. Now, hear me out here, okay, because my wife, Cherie, and my kids, they were already uh, out of town before lockdown happened, okay? So you would think, here I am, I've got uh, a house, a quiet house, home alone by myself, plenty of time to relax in my own space, screaming kids, not running around, all the rest. And while I didn't take that for granted, that is a good thing to have my own space, I just felt this kind of sense of restlessness as the weekend endured. You know, I wanted to watch the cricket and spend some time on the couch and try and do a bit of downtime, but then I had these niggling chores and these jobs around the house that I wanted to also get done and make sure the house was looking, you know, really schmick for when Cherie and the kids got home. And then, you know, I wanted to get out and exercise just to feel like I could leave my property and and have a bit more space. And then, you know, my phone would buzz and I'd click on a YouTube link and sure enough, I'm down one of those hour-long YouTube rabbit holes that we've all experienced at at some stage or another. And then being in bachelor mode, I thought it'd be a good idea, you know, to, to make the ultimate, well, what I think is kind of like the ultimate bachelor meal, like a big, juicy, greasy burger, right? Beef burger. So I made that, I, I crafted it all, it was fantastic, I loved it. But then I got to the end of having that, I was like, okay, well, what's next? I guess restless was a word that I could have used to describe my, my time over the last weekend. And as humans, each of us, we have needs and we have desires. Uh, Needs are things, basic things that we all need. Things like water, things like food, shelter, clothing for protection from the elements. These are things that we all need. But an interesting thing happens. Once Once our needs are met, what happens is our desires, they kick into action. Our desires come along. These are things that we long for. We have desires, things that we we want to have in our possession, uh, dreams that we have, hopes that we have, um, things that we would like to experience in our lives. These are all desires. Thomas Aquinas, a theologian and a Catholic priest, once asked this really bold, daring question. He, he posited the question of what would it take for us to satisfy those desires that you and I have? What would it take for us to have that 
ah moment and just feel completely satisfied. And the answer that he came up with was it would take everything. It would take everything and everyone. In other words, for you and I, that means that we would have to have every experience in life. We'd have to travel to every country, to every location, go to every restaurant, be in relationship with every single person to get to this point where we could feel completely satisfied. In other words, our desires are something that are just ongoing and infinite in our lives. They have no limit. And ultimately, if we are not careful, then our desires lead to this end result of restlessness. And we all have that that's ongoing, like I said, within us. And to make matters harder, we have the world around us and outside of us pushing images towards us advertising that we drive past, billboards, everything in our face, a lot of noise saying, you know, buy that latest piece of technology because it's going to make your life a heck of a lot easier or buy that red dress because that is going to make you feel and look amazing or buy that dishwashing liquid because it works 88.5% better than all other dishwashing liquid brands. Accumulation, accomplishment. Buy this, watch this, eat this, experience this. And then we have social media that comes into play, don't we? So not only do we get images and and noise and words from, from external sources, but some of those come from our family members and from people that we know, our friends, people that we actually have relationship with. John Mark Comer, the author of a book that's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, a book that that really spoke a lot to me, he says the following. He says that when our innate human restlessness collides with the digital age, the result is a culture-wide crisis of emotional unhealth and spiritual death. So... The question then is, if this is the case, if this is true, what do we do about this? How do we remain emotionally and spiritually healthy in our lives when it comes to this this idea of chronic restlessness? How can we push back from that? Is there something we can glean from the scriptures about this? And this morning, I want to say to you, the answer is yes, that you can experience real rest today. Not just physical rest, but deep rest for your soul that flows throughout. And we see the first idea of resting way back at the start of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When God, who goes through the six creation days, creates the heavens and the earth and the waters and the lands and and the animals, etc., etc. And then we get to the start of Genesis chapter 2 and it says the following, that thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array after these six days. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Do we get that? The God of all creation, he rests And in resting, in in making this pause at the end of the sixth day, what God is doing is he builds this rhythm into the tempo of a working week. Six days for work, resting for one. And so for you and I, when when we kind of fight against this this idea of of a rhythm that God, or a, a pattern that God has created here, then we actually get ourselves out of sync, out of tempo. A really great example of this was uh, back in the French Revolution. They wanted to increase productivity. And to do this, they thought, well, let's up our working week from seven days to 10 days, right? We're going to make our production and productivity go through the roof. Well, what happened? The complete opposite. It was disaster. Productivity actually went down. Mental illness increased. The suicide rate increased. Relationships began to break down. There was a whole bunch of stuff that happened to just make this 10-day work week just basically implode. And as a result, they had to go back to this seven-day rhythm that we know happens and that has been created and works for each one of us. 
And that's often why, you know, if you, if you have a really big week, a big six days or even one or two days, you'll often have that sleep in. You know, your body is kind of saying, if you have that sleep in, you're trying to catch up to the tempo, to the pace of that seven-day week that God has built into creation. But not only is there this rhythm or this pattern or tempo that, that's been shown here by God, he actually makes a provision for this thing that is called the Sabbath. And he makes this to the Israelite people after they get delivered from Pharaoh and, and they're out in the wilderness. This is what uh, the Lord says to Moses in Exodus 16, verse 4 to 5. The Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and to gather enough for that day. In this, I will test them and I will see whether they will follow my instruction. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they are to bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on all the other days. So God here, he doesn't let the Israelites store up bread for more than one day, except when it comes to this sixth day, where he lets them store up enough to last them for two days, to get them through that seventh day. And then here is what it says in Exodus 16, verses 25 to 30. Eat it today, Moses said. This is Moses speaking to the people. Because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and instructions? Bear in mind, the Lord has given you the Sabbath, and that is why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. In doing this, what God is doing is he's mandating or imp implementing this pause for the Israelites. Just as he stopped and rested on the seventh day, he's saying to the Israelites to do the same thing, to cease, to stop, and to rest. The Sabbath, as we're talking about here, is this practice of stopping. The word, the, it comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which literally means to cease or to stop. So that's what Sabbath is. And Sabbath is actually a spiritual discipline. It's like any sort of discipline that you might be involved in, whether you're, you're training hard for an event and that requires you going to the gym or waking up to go for a, to the gym really early in the morning, or you know, whether you want to learn a new skill or a new instrument and you're just spending like two minutes every day and you're just trying to build that discipline in, or whether you're trying to avoid certain foods and you're on a certain diet. These things actually require willpower. They require us to, uh, to have mental energy and a physical effort from us. Walter Brueggemann wrote this book called The Sabbath as Resistance. And he says the following about the Sabbath. He said that in our own contemporary context of the rat race of anxiety, the celebration of Sabbath is an act of both resistance and alternative. It is resistance because it is the visible insistence that our lives are not defined by, production, by the production and consumption of commodity goods. You see, so many of our things in our culture, they point us towards production and consumption, don't they? They point away then, as well, from rest. They're not pointing towards more rest. And so the Sabbath is this act of resistance in some sense. It's actually a way of saying enough with some of those things that are stopping me from being able to rest here. And practicing Sabbath is a way in which you and I can cultivate a spirit of restfulness that begins on one day and it gives us enough of a, ch of a charge to get through the rest of our week, to prepare our minds and our bodies for what is to come. I want to say that again because I think that's really important for us to hear. Practicing Sabbath is a way in which we cultivate a spirit of restfulness. 
But just like any sort of disciplines that we're doing, we've got to be careful. We've got to watch out for the pitfalls. We don't want to you know, get to that unhealthy, obsessive side. As well as that, we don't want to get to the legalistic side where we're just ticking something off and going, okay, I've ticked the box. Now let me get on with life. I'm rushing back into everything that I need to do. And this is something we see in the New Testament. Jesus is actually challenged on the Sabbath in several places. But one of those places, the Pharisees are actually trying to trap him and challenge him on what is lawful during the Sabbath and what is not. From the Gospel of Mark, we read this story. Mark chapter 2, verse 23 to 28. It says that one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as the disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And he answered them, Have you never heard what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So the Pharisees, they spot the disciples, they're plucking those little heads of grain off the, the grain field and they want to be the religious police here. They want to check in and, and try and challenge and corner Jesus. So they say, why are they doing what's unlawful? They should not be doing that at all. And Jesus responds with this verse 27 that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And In saying that, what he's saying is that God is the one who has created this for the well-being of humans, the Sabbath. It's not the other way around. God hasn't created the Sabbath as this rigid law which exists here and we have to try and get inside it and work with it and conform to it and be all restricted and make sure that we do what it it requires of us. No, the Sabbath has actually been created for our good. See, the Pharisees are arguing here, well, you know, the the disciples, they should have stored up enough grain for those two days and then they could eat. They should go hungry. They shouldn't be able to pluck those heads off the grain field. Let them starve. But Jesus here is saying that it doesn't violate God's will for hungry people to have something to eat on the Sabbath. He's saying this legalism that you're carrying on about, that's not what the Sabbath is about at all. The Sabbath was created for our good. It's a freeing, healthy discipline for us to be able to participate in. And as someone who has practiced Sabbath before from time to time, and someone who has also failed and stumbled through attempts at Sabbath, I want to say to you that if you are not or you haven't practiced Sabbath before, then you are potentially missing out on your best day of the week. Okay, hear me out here. If we know now that that our Sabbath is a way that we cultivate this spirit of restfulness, if we know that it was created for our good, what might this idea of a Sabbath day of rest actually look like for you and I in 2021? What, what could it look like? What are some of the things that we might want to be asking ourselves? I think one of the questions we can begin asking ourselves is, how, I based, how do I basically craft and create the best day of my week? To go a little bit further than that, what I want to give you this morning is four things that I think will hopefully be helpful in you thinking about uh, what the Sabbath is for and what the Sabbath might actually look like in your own lives. And those four things are stopping, resting, delighting and worshipping. Let's start with number one, stopping. This is a pretty obvious one, right? This is the idea of Shabbat, to cease, to stop. It's a literal stopping of work, but not just physically stopping of work. It's mentally as well. And this is often the harder one for us. It's harder for us, isn't it, to switch off what's going on up here than it is for us to sit down and switch off from what we would normally do or normally class as work. It's an opportunity for us to stop and cease from the hurry and the busyness in our lives. And and just because it is stopping or ceasing from work, it doesn't mean, our usual work, it doesn't mean that we should, you know, try and find excuses for doing those little catch-up jobs and trying to get ourselves even more busy with the stuff that doesn't kind of fall into the work-for-your-employer category. Number two, resting. 
Sabbath is an opportunity for us to experience physical rest. Sure, having a nap is good, you know, having a sleep in, I am all for that, that is great. But it's not just about physical rest, it's a way as well that we rest our mind, our body and our spirit as well. It's an opportunity for us to rest from the stress and the worry that we, that we have that will still be there in the other six days. Delighting, number three. As a part of delighting, what we're doing here is we're celebrating God's goodness in our own lives. We are intentionally delighting in God and who he is. You know, we do that here even on a Sunday morning, don't we? And in doing that, what we do, I think, is we're embracing that childlike faith, that childlike trust that we have to be able to say, you know, I trust you, God. I'm delighting in you. Whatever that stuff is that I hold on to, um, I'm going to let that go for this day. I'm going to trust and turn to you and delight in you. We delight in intentional time spent with those people that we love maybe outside of what we would normally do with them as well, making it something a little bit special, crafting um, an opportunity to interact with your loved ones in new and fresh and exciting ways in which you learn and discover more about them. It's also an opportunity for us to delight and play in creation that God has created for us to experience and to enjoy, uh, to enjoy the thrill of swimming in the ocean or jumping on the trampoline with your kids for those of you who don't have a bung knee, or sitting by a window and just you know, curling up on your favourite chair and, and reading a book. And in turn, by doing that, what we get to do is we get to delight in God and learn more about Him and who He is and His creation as well. And finally, number four, worshipping. This is the opportunity we have to focus our, our attention on God, to centre Him in our hearts, Now, this could look different in a number of ways. It might be an internal, silent practice where you're worshipping God, where you're you're speaking to Him. Or it might be verbal worship like we're doing this morning, where we're singing praise to our God in song and in music. We we also worship Him by being intentional with the time we spend talking to Him, don't we? In prayer, the time we spend to petition Him, not only with our own requests, but those things that He places on our heart for the world and the people around us. But as well as that, this is an opportunity, as we are talking about this idea of being still, to learn to be still in worship. Still enough that not only can we speak to God, but that we might be able to hear from him, taking that opportunity to just be still. And as well as that, we spend time in his truths, meditating on his word, learning, digging deeper into understanding who God is, his goodness in our lives. That's a part of our worship towards him as well. Stopping, resting, delighting, worshipping. Notice how free, how non-legalistic those things are. There's no real formula. There's no exact perfect way to do this. There's no schedule that we have to tick off or conform to. It's not about that. And might I also add that Sabbath is going to look different for those of you who are empty nesters than it is to those of you who have young families and have children hanging around. But ultimately, here are four ideas that I hope will help us to to cultivate a spirit of restfulness in our own lives. And when we begin to do this as well, I think what it does is it points us ultimately to our Creator. It points us to God. It points us to Jesus. And what does Jesus have to say specifically about rest? Well, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's the promise he has. You might be feeling a little bit weary even at the start of this year. Maybe there's something that's even happening in your life right now that's adding to that. Maybe there's some burden that you're carrying around at the moment. Something that's heavy, that's uncomfortable, that's weighing you down, that you're finding hard to get through. Maybe you're feeling a bit restless or you identify with that idea of being more restless than you do with being restful. Whatever it is, Jesus here is saying, come to me. This is an invitation that he has for you this morning. He's saying, come to me. 
doesn't matter where you're at, doesn't matter what's happened, if you've messed up, wherever you're at, come to me. My grace is sufficient. I love you. I'm inviting you into my presence. And you know what he's saying? When you come, this is the promise. I'm going to give you real rest. And if you don't know Jesus this morning, this sort of real rest is only available through a relationship with him. And so the invitation exists for you as well to trust in him, to put your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Saviour and experience this real rest that he offers. To finish, I want to say that when we do this, when we're cultivating this spirit of restfulness in our lives, something incredible happens. You know, we spoke about desires at the start. Well, you know what? Our desires get ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Our needs are met and fulfilled and satisfied in him. And so today what I want to do is invite you to think about this idea of practicing a ceasing, a Sabbath pause in your own life. And in doing so, I think what you're saying is a couple of things. I think you're saying one is enough with that pace and the desires of the world around me. I am going to stop here because I have enough ultimately in Jesus And I'm going to recognize that on this Sabbath day of rest. And when we do that, there are real benefits in our life, I think. We're able to actually achieve with a full uh, degree of stamina, I guess, from a place of restfulness, what God has for us in the next six days of the week. And in turn, I think we're actually better equipped as well to carry out what Jesus calls the greatest commandment for you and I to consider. And that is to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, all our mind and all of our strength. But not only to do that, to also love our neighbours, love those people that we come into contact with wherever it is, at the shops, our friends, in our own backyards, to be able to love them from that place of restfulness and energy and resting in Jesus and who he is. May we be these sorts of people, these living examples of what it means for us to be still and rest. Let's pray together, shall we? Father God, this morning, as we're talking about this idea of resting, it's one that doesn't naturally come easy to many of us. But we know that you are the one who rested on that seventh day. And so there is good in in doing so. There is a tempo. There is a rhythm to our lives that exists. But we are restless souls at times, God. And so we need your help. We need your help to cultivate that spirit of restfulness in our own lives. And we thank you that you are the one, Jesus, who invites us to come before you to experience real rest, to centre our hearts and our minds on you and that in doing so we will receive deep, satisfying soul rest that only comes from you, Jesus. That all the things in the world, they cannot satisfy ultimately, but you can. I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning, Lord, that as they maybe think about this idea of cultivating uh, a spirit of restfulness and Sabbath in their lives, Lord, that they would go easy and rest in your grace, that they wouldn't take this as a legalistic thing or something that needs to be ticked off or or also, Lord, that if they attempt it and, and it doesn't work out, that they wouldn't be hard on themselves, but rather they would ultimately continue to turn towards you to give over those things and look to you so that way we might receive real rest. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.